going to begin recording. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Rupert Nikos. He is the Alumni Distinguished Undergraduate Professor of Psychology at North Carolina State University. Oh dear, there we go. Uh, he served in the uh, US Navy from 1972 to 1976. He was trained along with others by the Department of Justice as a facilitator to deal with serious racial problems and to create dialogue among sailors. He's worked very hard in adding academic degrees. Uh, Dr. Nikos has worked as a scholar activist uh, of interpersonal and intergroup relations. <clears throat> Sorry, I have this there. Uh, he is on the faculty of North Carolina State University, go Wolfpack, since 1988. He's the winner of the 2013 UNC Board of Governors Teaching Excellence Award. He has a captivated, captivating oratorial style to engage people to see their own role in moments, move, excuse me, moments of tension in social interaction. He is the winner of the 2020 Outstanding Teaching and Mentoring Award for the Ninth Division of the American Sociological Association and the Society for Sociological Studies <clears throat> in Social Issues. Uh, he mentioned that he will be doing a, uh, some things for Quail Books, uh, at the bookstore, and you will see it here, his uh, books that he has published, uh, his memoir, Making Gumbo in the University, and was followed by Taking on Diversity, How We Can Move from Anxiety to Respect, and then following up on his newest book, To Live Woke, Thoughts to Carry in Our Struggle to Save the Soul of America. <clears throat> his topic today is to live woke using the force. And we have had the opportunity to review uh, a TED talk uh, in preparation for this meeting. And so at this point, I would like to welcome Dr. Nakoth and please begin your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the Rotary E-Club for Social Justice for inviting me to talk with your community members about the interpersonal intergroup issues we are struggling with as a nation. I have the long view. I've been working on interpersonal intergroup issues since my time in the United States Navy, 1972 to 1976. I do indeed have the long view. In that long view, I can see that we are at another important transition point in dealing with intergroup issues. We as a nation have gone through other transitions. Before my time, the enslavement of African people onto the emancipation, onto reconstruction, onto my growing up time of Jim Crow legal racial segregation, onto desegregation, onto conversations about diversity, and now onto conversations about diversity and inclusion. Right now we are at the newest stage, neo-diversity, an interpersonal situation in which we all have to encounter and interact with people who are not like us on some dimension. People who do not look like, sound like, believe like, or love like us. In that new context, the co-occurrence of the COVID-19 social isolation and the very public hideous murder of Mr. George Floyd has created a COVID-19 woke effect. America has been stunned into a new awareness of the sometimes brutal intergroup dynamics that have been a constant in the lives of African-Americans, cutting across all the group identities of American culture. That new startled awareness has activated a hunger to understand and to do something to help end racism. Have you noticed the mix of people involved in the Black Lives Matter protest? Trust this 70 year old when he says this is different. The mix of people involved in these protests is unlike anything we have ever seen. Remember, I do have the long view. Unlike any other time in our history, these protests are made up of neo-diverse America, 
young and old, black and white, Latinx, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, persons carrying signs to tell us that they are gay, lesbian, or transgender. That neo-diversity of protesters has disturbed the old order and caused and caused an old st set of style of set of voices to cry out, you want too much. You don't understand. Come on, we can't change everything that fast. And that is where I and my concept of neo-diversity can help people find productive ways of thinking and acting in this new intergroup context. My book, To Live Woke, is centered on the concept of neo-diversity. With stories from my life and my teaching at NC State, to Live Woke is set up in 46 short essay chapters. I wrote and crafted it that way because there are so many us versus them topics that connect to our nation's neo-diversity situation. I also put it together in small bits to give the reader psychological space to pause in, to reflect and process these topics that we all know cause tension. There is real social justice work before all of us. How does the neo-diversity mix of people pushing for change give us power? It puts us in an extraordinary position to use the force, as I like to say. With that in mind, let me read from To Live Woke, Chapter 8, Using the Force. Radicals and hippies, people said. In the 60s, many Americans blamed student protest on radicalism. Young people and college students wanted too much, too fast. They just didn't understand. They were too radical. That was the pushback to say that the protests weren't legitimate. Soft crybabies, too thin-skinned, people say. In the 21st century, many Americans blame student protests on weakness. Young people and college students can't take real life. They're spoiled, never been pushed to grow up. They got no backbone. That's the pushback to say the protests on college campuses today aren't legitimate, except that student protests in the 60s were legitimate because something old and anti-American needed to change, racial and gender oppression, except that student protests right now are legitimate because something old and anti-American needs to be addressed and changed, left over the meaning language of hate that is about and that is aimed at people from different groups of by race, sex, mental health condition, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender identity, bodily condition, and religion. Leftover anti-group prejudice and bigotry aimed at America's neo-diversity. After knocking down the most visible structural walls of discrimination, we did not clean up the rubble. Students and the rest of America are free, but have to walk through the rubble of change, the social psychological leftovers. Protests on college campuses in today's 21st century are about less structural, more interpersonal, and yet still real issues. Today's campus protest issues are reflecting the interpersonal issues that are abroad in the streets of America, causing people to stumble and fall. With the structural walls now turned to rubble, Americans are struggling to stand without wobbling while having to interact with each other. Rubble is in their path. Some spots of the rubble are worse than others. Some places in America, the rubble just makes walking difficult. Some locations, though, the rubble is thick, sharp-edged, high, unstable, and still steaming, making our walking treacherous. All over, Americans are tiptoeing through rubble to get to the store, to class, to work, to play, while keeping a watchful eye on those other Americans who they are now able to see since the walls of segregation have been knocked down. America is nervous about diversity. Tiptoeing, hop skipping over and through the leftover rubble with their eyes multitasking, Americans are stumbling, bumping into each other. Pupils dilated with the strain of the search to answer the neo-diversity anxiety question, who are the we and who are among the they? When there is a stumble, a bumping, the blame is put on the group membership of the person bumped. That blame comes out in the language of intergroup hate. Anti-group slurs are proclaimed loud and proud, turning an interpersonal bump into a larger intergroup matter. Language bigotry is epidemic, is an epidemic infecting all of higher education, aimed at our students or their classmates as a joke, but really to try to intimidate and demean to try to keep students from certain groups in their place. They don't belong here anyway. 
I have to ask them, why are the adults trying so hard to teach college students to show tolerance for intolerance? College students today live in social environments where language bigotry is all around them as an everyday occurrence. We seem to have forgotten that people who protest injustice have always been told, you're just too sensitive. Blacks have been told this, women, disabled people, homosexuals, always the first way to try to, dis to dismiss the importance of the issues raised was and is to say they're just being too sensitive. In higher education, too many administrators and faculty seem to forget that we have, with care, selected these young people to be citizens of our campus. Our students are smart, they can read, they can do research, they can learn to be critical thinkers and observers. That's why we selected them. It is silly and arrogant then to behave as if all we have to do is just say to them, you're being too sensitive and those smart, especially since daily, these young people experience the leftover rubble of our nation's past intergroup history. We have left in their way, we have left in their way the language bigotry rubble that is reflected in the larger intergroup matters happening in the streets of America, Ferguson, Baltimore, not to mention the city of Chicago. Our college students see that connection. Our students realize the issues are the same, but we want to tell them they are just too sensitive. Look, college students are not protesting about trigger warnings, except for saying on the first day of class, you're not going to like this class. I do not warn my students that any of my lectures might make them uncomfortable teaching the confrontational challenging way that I do with student evaluations as a major criteria in the process of evaluation. I have won every major teaching award available on, at my university. No doubt college students can take and want to learn from the hard truth. Today's students protests are not about trigger warnings. College students protests are about the very real problems of interpersonal intergroup disrespect they experience evidence shows us that all manner of anti-group slurs is used on college campuses, on the food courts, in the libraries, in the residence halls, at fraternity and sorority parties, and at tailgates. That's the dark side of college life. We have not been managing. Being on the cusp of losing the soul of higher education, we are in danger of losing the soul of America. That should be protested, fought against. Students should demand that the intergroup dynamics of their campuses be managed better. Students should demand and other Americans should support their demand for change. Please understand that across our country, we are all in the leftover psychological rubble, tiptoeing, stumbling, bumping into each other, sometimes in panic, trying to catch a stumble to prevent a fall. Too many of us are reaching out and ripping at the quilt of American life. We need to support the protest of our students to, to work to strengthen the stitching of that American fabric. We cannot afford to let that fabric be torn to bits by our stumbling wobbles because that fabric is the makings of the social psychological quilt we have been sewing together all along. Sewn together, that fabric, that quilt is what we are promised as the more perfect union that will be what keeps the soul of America warm. Without that quilt, with only tattered remnants of that promise, we ourselves will become the bereft who are confused, frantic, lost, lonely, and cold. Students are protesting with good reason. Not only is it the right thing to do, it is, right, is their, it is their right to do so. Yet we are telling college students, some of America's future leaders, that they should learn to show tolerance for intolerance. Why are so many pushing future leaders of America to, to accept the dark side of social life? No one should have to tolerate in your face intolerance. Just as students were in the 1960s, students today are willing to risk being arrested because too many people are trying to silence their voices and claims to a dream. For all students, including African-Americans, women, Muslims, Latinos, for all the other students, this is college life that was supposed to be the best time of their lives. But now with public hateful racial graffiti, shouted ethnic slurs, swastikas put in public places, sexual assaults, it's not that. Damn, the dark side of the real world is here. And so the dream is deferred, if not lost. 
students, all Americans have a right to freedom of speech. That includes the right to say to someone, you cannot speak to me or of me or of my classmates or coworkers in that way. And if that kind of speech is pervasive in my environment, I have the right to report it to the authorities. There are statutes that prohibit the creation and maintenance of hostile organizational environments. And if my grievance is not heard through those channels, I have the right to protest. Fall 2015, the University of Missouri was all over the news. More than once at that university, a neo-diverse mix of students had held Racism Lives Here protest rallies. Hearing nothing from upper administration of the university, one student went on a very public hunger strike, concerned student 1950. Faculty leadership began to issue statements of support for the students' concerns. Some academic departments also raised their voices of common concern. 20 African-American members of the University of Missouri football team threatened to boycott games. White teammates joined the boycott. Then the voice of the governor of the state of Missouri joined in speaking against racism on the campus. Sudden and abrupt, the resignation started. The president of the system, then the chancellor of the campus. A dream deferred leads first to anxiety and frustration, but anxiety and frustration lead to anger. At the undoing of their college dreams, of innocence. Students today say in anger, oh, it's on. No empty threat. Those social motivations can be powerful and effective force, as they were at the University of Missouri. Today, student voices are finally being heard. The force is finally being used. There has been an awakening. So ends chapter eight of my book. But the awakening continues this weekend in Texas. At the University of Texas, the band will not play because members of the band refuse to play the song, The Eyes of Texas. Why? Because they have learned the racial history of the song. All of the social justice protests of today are occurring because there has been an awakening. This generation is active not out of anger or hate, not seeking revenge, but demanding a reckoning. It is the line from the movie Tombstone spoken by Doc Holliday, by the Doc Holliday character. He says, no, make no mistake. It's not revenge he's after. It's a reckoning. There has been an awakening. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Nikos, for that um, presentation and uh, we open it up for questions. Uh, if someone would like to ask a question, you can put it in ch chat or you can uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Mm -hmm. D. Dr. Nacosta, I was curious as to whether the um, enrollment of your class in the last several years has shifted in terms of uh, diversity. And I was wondering if that is something that has been true in recent years or has always been true for the classes, but particularly I loved, I, I've got, I've got one senior in college and two that have recently graduated. And I think they see things in a, you know, they, they've taught me a lot. Let's put it yeah, that I'm way. Sure they, did. <laughs> they do. And, um, and I'm wondering if you have seen any trend in your own classes um, mm -hmm. in terms of diversity. A uh, couple of things to say about that. Uh, the feeder for my upper level interdependence and race course is my sophomore level course, interpersonal relationships that, uh, sorry, introduction to social psychology which I teach as a course on interpersonal relationship development and the dynamics thereof. Uh, so the feeder is that, that's a huge class, 200 students. So that class is automatically mixed because it's, uh, it's fulfilled some kind of requirement. I forget what it is. But that doesn't mean people have to sign up for my upper level course because it's an elective course. So when I first started teaching interdependence and race or interpersonal relationships and race, it's had two names. Uh, it was small because it was experimental, it was 20 students, but it was already racially mixed and gender mixed. That has always been the case. Mm -hmm. What's been interesting to watch is the increasing mix 
by way of race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. Hmm. So you don't always you don't know sexual orientation unless somebody tells you. But what's happened is over time, more and more students who uh, are gay, lesbian, transgender have been in the class and have revealed themselves in the class during hmm. a class discussion, which I always have to manage for my for the students. I have a safe space rule and all of that. Uh, but when the moment happens, they know that I'm watching. The other thing that's happened, 2016, the class up until then had gone as high as 40, 50, 60 students. Summer of 2016, during the presidential campaign, I was at home and I decided just on a whim to check the enrollment for the fall for my interdependence and race course. And I was stunned. It had popped up to 80. It reached capacity. And it has been 80 ever since. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is two things. Students have become much more interested in understanding what's going on, understanding the dynamics of interpersonal relations and race. And two, they have come in the class intensely focused. So what do I mean? One of the exercises I do early in the, in the class to get a sense of what people are interested in is I literally ask them, tell me what topics you hope to get that we get to talk about in a course called interpersonal relations and race. Usually, in the past, it has started with kind of stereotypes, how we deal with that, da, 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 da. <laughs> 2016, it got right particularly focused. <laughs> it was like, one, interracial relationships, romantic. Two, politics and race. Three, and it was like, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so they come ready now. Mm. And I'm so hurt that we are in this pandemic because I can't have that dynamic going on in my classroom right now. Mm -hmm. But that's life. That, thank you. That's sure. Great. Suzanne, I think you have a question. You have to unmute yourself. Trying, it's, you always fumble when it's your turn because you don't want to make noise. Um, I was just wondering if the university was supportive and I personally really worry about young white men because uh, like in Charlottesville, it looked like a lot of the people there, um, you know, with the torches were younger white men. Uh, could you just comment? I'm just interested in your, your thoughts. Sure. Here's one of the things that's going on uh, that I do deal with in my class in my own way. One of the things that's going on is we've created a, too many people, I'm gonna say everybody, too many people have created an us versus them as they try to do diversity work. What does that mean? Well, they try to aim blame at uh, a group. So it's all, you know, it's all white males that are at fault. And notice, and anytime you do all, you're in real trouble mm -hmm. because it pushes people back. So in my class, how do I deal with that? There are some principles I teach in my class that I start teaching from the very first day. Never try to interact with a person as a representative of a group. Mm. Okay, which means nobody should be doing that at all. Second, I say, there are no innocent. Mm. In my class, that first day I tell them, we are not gonna talk about ever this vague idea of white privilege. And they're like, oh, we're not? No, because it's not a concept. It's not scientifically based and it's used as an attack and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. My training in the United States Navy was to create dialogue opportunities, which means bringing everyone into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Not creating us versus them. There are issues that we should talk about, about language, talk about how we interact with people, talk about how we look at people. But we are all contributing mm -hmm. to some of these intergroup problems. And immediately, and they've told me this, I've had white male students come to me on the side and say, thank you. Now I feel like I, like I can be part of the conversation. So if we don't continue to, to deal with that in that way, we create this us versus them, 
uh, where groups are pushed aside and feel left out and get angry about it. And then, wow. Thank you, that was my real worry. I'm looking to see if there are any other hands. I don't see anything in chat other than, uh, you know, thank you for the, for the presentation, Dr. Nakas, and great perspective and fascinating insights. Uh, very much appreciated. All right. I see a hand. Do you see? Oh, Marie. Yep. Can you give us an example, Dr. Nakost, of a student who had a, a real awakening, a personal awakening that was, you know, really left your heart warm? Oh, OK. Uh, hmm, interesting. Hey, you made me think of someone in particular. That's so interesting that she would pop into my head when you ask that question. Uh, young white female, very smart, as almost all of them are, uh, but came with this idea, a, a little bit of a chip on her shoulder uh, about race. She kept asking questions about, well, are there, is there like a hierarchy of racial stuff or groups that you shouldn't really ever talk about versus, I'll say, okay. But then when we got to talking about racial slurs, she asked this question. She, she said that this is what she said, but this, she said this to me, not in class. She said this to me in a conversation. She said, it makes me really angry that I can't use the word, use the N word. It's like, huh, that's interesting. Tell me why. She couldn't really articulate it, but then I had lectures coming up about that where I talked about not only the power of racial slurs, but the root of racial slurs. At the end of the semester, she stuck with it. The end of the semester, I remember her sitting in my office uh, because she just wanted to have an appointment. I didn't know why. And she just wanted to thank me for shifting her understanding of the power of this language, understanding of why that language uh, should not be uh, used by anyone that's part of my lecture structure. Um, and so she had, she had an awakening. There are all kinds of different awakenings that happened in my class, but she popped into my head. Thank you. Any other hands? I'm scrolling through. I may be ahead of this, Mary, but I'm wondering oh. how, how do we get your book? <laughs> how do we get the woke book? Oh, oh, to live woke. Uh, Quail Ridge has a bunch of copies. You can get it from Amazon and all that as well. You can get it from my publisher, uh, Prentice House Press. But Quail Ridge has done a very good job of keeping it uh, on the shelves for ordering. Great, great, thanks. I don't, I don't know where people are, so I'll say Quail Ridge. Farrington has it as well, the McIntyre. Ah, great. Let me comment on these earlier comment about learning from young people. <clears throat> when I started the, teaching this course, when I created the course, given my history and what my training was as a social psychologist and my training in the military, I really had kind of this almost narrow focus on race, interpersonal relationships and race. Very early in, that, in teaching the course, students started asking this question. Well, is it only race, Dr. Narkoff? I said, well, well, no, but what do you, and then I would do this, what do you have in mind? And they would tell me a story. I was like, mm, okay. So more and more the students, see, I grew up in the Jim Crow South. I grew up on the legal racial segregation. So my cognitive network is filled with the us versus them of race. What I didn't was I, what I wasn't aware of, but my students helped me become aware of, was how intergroup their lives were. Were they just dealing with race? Oh no. Race, yeah, sure. Ethnicity, sexual orientation, and, and, and uh, gender identity. 
And so I had to learn how to incorporate that. It fits very well into the neodiversity concept, but I didn't start there. They literally pushed me there in a beautiful way. Uh, I've had a look. <laughs> so pronouns. I literally have to tell my students, you know, when I was growing up first, there was no respectful language for transgender people. I mean, nothing. Second, you ain't talking about no stinking pronouns? What are you talking about? <laughs> they laugh at me and they say, but. <laughs> so I've learned. I've learned this on my syllabus. Now, one of my uh, students, <laughs> transgender young man, who had and revealed himself to me in my Psych 311 course, was in my Psych 411 course at that point, and said, Dr. Nakos, why don't you put your pronouns on your syllabus? And I was like, uh. <laughs> and all I said was, okay. <laughs> uh, so it's a dynamic. I mean, it's a relationship development thing going on with me. Uh, interacting with Muslim students, um, traditional Muslim students, where I'm a touchy professor. Uh. You know, one of my favorite stories is this. Two traditionally dressed Muslim women in my Psych 311 course. They came to me at the end of class when I'm taking questions in the big auditorium. They came together, they sat together, and they came together. And they're asking me about uh, an excuse absence for a Muslim holiday, religious holiday. And I said, of course. Just let my TA know, we'll make sure you get an excuse absence. I said, anything else? They said, no, Dr. Narcos, that's all. I said, okay, fine. And literally, because of the way I, have intera I interact with students, I reached out and touched both of them and then went on with my business. But at that point, I was learning about what it meant to be a traditional woman interacting with a man outside of your family. Right. Later that evening, it slammed into me what I had done. And I just, I was like, oh, shit. Wasn't going to see him for a while because of the holiday. But when they did come back at the end of the lecture that day, I literally turned, found them in the group as they were trying to leave and said, come in. They came down thinking that they had done something wrong, probably. Uh, of course, they hadn't. And they stood in front of me and immediately, as soon as they got close to me, I put my hands behind my back because I know my tendency. And I said, I am sorry that I offended you by touching you last time. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say, I'm sorry if I offended you. That's not an apology. I said, I am sorry that I offended you by touching you last time. And then I waited. And they looked at me, looked at each other, started smiling with each other. I don't know what they were smiling about. Finally, one of them said, it's okay, Dr. Narcos. We think of you as an uncle. <laughs> would, would you mind repeating when you had the TED talk about what to say when an offensive remark is made? Sure. I've tried to memorize that. That was beautiful. Yeah, it's in books, it's in all my, it's in all my books. <laughs> because it's a very important strategy. It's based on a set of scientific experiments published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. How, what do, you, how do you deal with that moment? When somebody says something that's a stereotype, that's a slur uh, against a group, race, gender, ethnicity, blah, 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 what do you do? Well, what people tend to do is start to yell and scream and call people racist. Okay, that's not useful. That doesn't do it. That doesn't do anything except lock people into the position. The strategy is to say this, excuse me, I find that kind of language offensive. It hurts me and then stop talking. Don't argue. I find that kind of language offensive. I find that use of uh, stereotypes offensive, I, but always end with it hurts me. It hurts me and then stop talking. It's a very powerful moment. It's a very powerful strategy. It puts the person on alert about 
what your standard is for a continued interaction. You didn't tell them what they had to do. You just said, you're interacting with me. I find that offensive and it hurts me. And then they got to deal with that. So some version of, excuse me, I find that kind of language offensive. I find the use of that kind of stereotype offensive. It hurts me. I prefer not to, sometimes I say it this way, I prefer not to hear that kind of language. It hurts me. Some version of that. But it's in to live woke, it's in taking on diversity. It is an important strategy. But back to my Muslim student story, I just wanna point out that I'm always developing these relationships and those relationships teach me a lot of stuff. Uh, so I have the advantage as I say in To Live Woke, I have the great advantage of being in an environment that is neo-diverse in a very active way. Not a lot of people have this in their lives. So I understand that I'm in an advantage position, which is why I try to use that advantage position to teach others because the world is neo-diverse and we're all gonna be confronted with these opportunities. Any other questions for Dr. Nahat? I'm looking to see if there are any hands waving. I love, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm in Chicago. So I forgot, I got mixed up on the time zone. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Nakos. It's Hello, wonderful Melissa. to see you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic. And I'm just, I've been looking forward to your talk for months. <laughs> so they, re I'm, they recorded it, so you'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. And um, thank you. I just love everything. And so I wanted to, um, I love the term you just used of what is it, the neo diverse, that we're neo diverse. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, I think it's so helpful to have the words, to have vocabulary that allows us to understand what's going on, right? To understand in a way that um, is kind of, as soon as you hear neo-diverse, well, then that kind of explains, we're not just diverse, we're all scrunched together diverse. <laughs> it's a new kind of diversity. One of the reasons I did that, because I realized we needed a change in language. Yeah, yeah. You say diversity and people think, so this is what has happened. So I've started talking about neo-diversity and right. online somebody has asked uh, like, well, who qualifies as neo-diverse? So I've had to clarify. Mm. Neo-diversity is not a who. Yeah. Neo-diversity is a what. It's a situation that we are all in. No matter who we are. Look at what just happened. Okay. So sexual orientation. Uh, one of the neo is a part of neo diversity, of course. Well, just two days ago, something happened that's really dramatic. The Pope. Yes. Yes. There we go. Civil unions. Oh my God. Somebody said online, well, that's just a small step. I was like, do you know the history of the Catholic Church? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yes, it, it oh. was major. It was major. I but what that does is it, it legitimizes through the structure of the Catholic Church that love is just love. So you can't make the argument, oh, there's something wrong. No, that. Was, <laughs> One of the that jokes running like around right now is. Sorry. That was like yeah. stepping on the moon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of the jokes running around right now online is. Is the Pope Catholic? Okay. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. You know but what? But that's the neo diversity it's dynamic. It's neo. It's a dynamic. Social neo change is happening. Mm -hmm. It's neo Catholic. <laughs> but that's neo Catholic. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the kind of thing that my work is all about. Well, we have trying to help people trying to help people navigate that and understand it. So, well, what I found in one of the things I found interesting, Dr. Nakost, is that you work with young people, young minds, and developing and 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 uh, talking about issues and how 
to live in this world woke. But at the same time, your acknowledgement that they have taught you. Okay. And I think, I think your openness uh, to that is, is great. I think it's beneficial uh, to definitely to the students to be heard and, um, and for you to, uh, uh, to acknowledge that. And then also, I think that allows you to uh, further reach out to those of us who don't have those interactions and through your writing, let us know, you know, the kinds of things that are going on. Um, and it's no small change. So thank you for that. Uh, I am going to share my screen again at this time. There we go. And uh, we've finished that. And Dr. Nakas, we will be sending you uh, the uh, certificate of appreciation that is shown here for your uh, presentation to us today from the Rotary E-Club of Social Justice.